Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity for us, and uh, I'm Tim Martin. I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal in Atlanta. I cover most of the U.S. prescription drug supply chain and public health. And today I'm joined uh, by Marsha Guida James, Director of Provider Engagement at Humana. And our topic today is, can we expect different outcomes if we keep doing the same things? Well. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, no, the, the, the short answer is obviously no. Um, there, there really is um, a sea change going on, and I think that's why we're all here. Um, but clearly, you know, doing, doing the same things, we'll, we'll just be in the same situation as we have been all sure. along. So uh, the theme of this uh, conference is, is, is around unlocking patient engagement. And as an insurer, you've you know, been, been had this task and this role of engaging both patients and physicians. Tell me a little bit about where we stand with that. Now there's, I think there was some research yesterday we were talking about earlier about how we're seeing some convergence of, of these two types. Right, so um, it, in my world um, and, and, and in my perspective, I, you know, we see, we've seen where you have provider engagement, um, you know, health plans, um, the the uh, the public side engaging physicians and providers, and and we've now seen a um, movement towards engaging patients because in the past it was all about you know let's let's get the processes in place let's get the physicians engaged. Well, there was a big hole there in that patients weren't being engaged, and I think now we're starting to see a convergence. Um, a, an alignment, if you will. Um, I think things in the past have been, uh, you know, going down a parallel path. And, and now you're starting to see some convergence with uh, the development uh, on a national level of patient reported outcomes, uh, patient level engagement, uh, and incorporating that uh, into uh, the engagement picture as a whole. Sure. What are going to be some of the hurdles in getting to that point? So I think there are going to be hurdles. There, there are different hurdles. There are several different hurdles. I think one of the largest hurdles clearly in that alignment um, is going to be the, uh, the sharing of data and the movement of data. Um, I, I think you've seen uh, where we've got physicians and providers and hospitals now getting to that tipping point depending upon what you read, but getting to that tipping point of being able to have electronic medical records and being able to uh, share data. Um, and I think that, um, so <coughs> data and IT infrastructure is one hurdle. I think another hurdle as we talk about alignment of incentives and a ways to get both physicians and patients engaged is the reimbursement structure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's the other Might be large, some interest in that in the crowd. <laughs> that's the other large piece of this. Sure. Um, well, you know, you, you mentioned IT and tell me, just update us with, uh, how many physicians do we have here in, in, in the crowd? Yeah, okay. Uh, quite, a, quite a few. Um, just update us with, us with what Humana has offering in terms of communicating, getting everyone on the same page. That's a big theme here. Well, I, I think from, from my perspective at Humana and a lot of other health plans, I mean, you know, we're, we're not the only one out there, but a lot of other health plans are um, developing ways to um, communicate with physicians on an IT level. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's moving from the, the snail mail mm -hmm. uh, way of communicating uh, more to a closer to a real time um, information sharing with physicians. Um, you know, at least from, from our perspective, um, specifically at Humana, I mean, we've developed, uh, we, we actually purchased a company called Certify mm -hmm. that helps um, translate disparate EMR system languages into one. So that, you know, I think. Humana, as well as other um, health plans, are making huge strides um, in this IT type data and infrastructure play. Sure. Explain to me a little bit uh, what would be the 
ideal. And, and I forgot to mention this at the very beginning. We will want this to be an active uh, session and, and uh, we'll open up uh, for questions. Certainly, I'm sure there will be some uh, here in a bit. But talk to me, uh, this, this integration of technology, getting on the same page, what, um, what might that look like? What's the ideal and, and wow. how could that look You know, like? I've, I've thought a lot about this. Um, it, and in, in order for there to be harmony in the system, um, ideal state would be where there is the inclusion of patient-centered data or patient-engaged data. So the patient says, you know, I've had my knee replaced, this has been my experience. So <clears throat> there's the inclusion of that data. Um, there would be the inclusion um, appropriately of physician um, physician data, and, and when I say physician data, I mean allowing um, for patients to understand what the different skill sets of their physicians are. Um, and, and, and I know I'm being a little bit vague, so I guess what I'm saying is that patients have choice in, in physicians. Um, the other ideal state would be real-time sharing of data um, so that uh, in our current structure, you know, there's there's a patient goes to get their mammogram, uh, and the provider of service sends a claim in. That claim may not come in for some time. It may come in right away. It may not. So I think um, in a perfect world, getting that information in immediately, um, whether it supports a fee for service structure or a more value based structure. Um, I think that for me is some ideal ideal world. Yeah. Well, lay the landscape for us right now in terms of we're talking a lot about uh, real time tracking, a lot of IT and and technological and and there are, if you just go outside, there are a lot of companies, startups trying to to provide this uh, uh, platform with which to share information. Where where are we at now uh, from a from an insurer perspective? You you have dialogue all the time with physicians and and patients. Where are we at just in terms of uh, having the infrastructure to get to that point you just m mentioned? You know, I think we are at a toddler stage, is how I would characterize it at this mm -hmm. point. I think we're crawling before we get to walk. Um, I believe that, um, you know, right now the landscape is, there's a lot of talking going on, there's a lot of activity going on, but I don't feel at this point that we're at the place where things are humming along very sweetly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that, that right now, um, you know, the, the landscape is early. We're early in being able to have all the data that we need everywhere. It's in disparate places right now. And it's not all um, at a point where the data can all come together. Mm -hmm. So I think we're we're getting we're getting there and we're going to get there. We're just not right. we're not we'll be adolescents probably in another couple of years is my guess. All right. Well, you mentioned data several times yeah. uh, already. Just uh, this is a bit of a hypothetical situation, but I'm, I'm, once we have the data, once we've blossomed into an adult, what are we going to do with that data and you know, to, in terms of outreach to physicians, to, oh. to individuals? Oh, the places will go. Um, I, I think, to borrow from Dr. Seuss, but I <laughs> think that um, where will we go with that? I think um, once we have all that data, I think the reimbursement structure will change. Um, it will, and everybody in here I know is familiar with going from volume to value. So I think at that time, we will have made the, the movement uh, completely to, to paying for value-based care. Mm -hmm. And we will also be at the point in terms of engagement for physicians and engagement for their patients, um, we will have reached the point where physicians and providers are no longer waiting for data to get to them mm -hmm. about their population. Um, patients are much more engaged and able to um, understand where they stand and physicians, as well as health plans, will be able to know better how to engage those patients. Mm. But it's, in my opinion, it's, it's a lot of it is about, large piece of it, it's about the data. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Uh, give me your thoughts then on if, you, if we have the data and the individual has the data, I mean, what, one of the big hurdles I think physicians face is um, all of the evidence is saying, you know, you need to get this screening done, you get that test done, and there's some pushback from the individual. I mean, maybe they don't, can't afford it or they just don't think they, they need this certain diagnostic. Uh, and then the insurer ends up talking to the physician and say, Dr. Jones, Ms. Mrs. Jones, you know, or Mrs. Williams isn't getting this test. What, how does data help, right. help solve that? So, so right now, um, you've, you've got a situation playing out right now with um, the, the chance to encourage patients. And physicians, you know, as your physician, you would encourage them to get a colonoscopy. Um, you've got health plans also messaging the patient. Mm -hmm. So scenario, health plans messaging the patient. Mrs. Jones, get your colonoscopy. You really, you know, it's recommended. You need to have a colonoscopy. You've got physicians trying to move their patients to get their preventative screenings done. Um, and, and of course, that's in the understanding that physicians are incredibly, incredibly busy just trying to keep their practices going. Um, you've got health plans um, incenting physicians, I know our health plan does, incents physicians on the management of their population. So did, did you, Dr. Jones, get Mrs. Smith to encourage her to get her colonoscopy? And did she indeed get her colonoscopy? Well. The pushback that we get from physicians, and, and rightly so, is I can't make Mrs. Jones go get her, ma her colonoscopy. I, I can't make her. I can talk to her till I'm blue in the face, but she won't get it done. So I, I think that um, you know, as we as we um, kind of bring all of that together, um, I think health plans will better. Uh, understand what makes consumers tick. You'll have aligned incentives from the patients or consumer side so that you've got everybody rowing the boat to the same place. Mm -hmm. Instead of this boat going here, this boat going here, it's going to converge, as we talked about just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, um, Humana, are, are, do you guys have any early efforts here to collect some of this data? And what, what might be some of the learnings in terms of you know what 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 ticks with the, the right, consumer with, or, with the, the consumer or the physician, or the physician yeah. right? So um, I'll share right now that um, we are doing a lot of experimentation around consumer behavior. We've been doing it for a while. We will continue to do it to understand mm -hmm. what are those things, whether it be social media, gamification. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes that consumer tick? As well on the provider side, we are doing. Uh, we're working with behavioral economists. Mm -hmm. to try and understand what makes providers think. How, what, how do providers, how do physicians think? Um, there, there's some great books out there actually called How Doctors Think. Um, and, and I think as we keep moving forward, we're going to um, understand better how physicians think, how patients think, and, it's, and, and we're going to make, make the system more harmonized. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how do physicians think? I'd be interested in your, <laughs> in your perspective well, on this. Well, uh, okay, so full disclosure, I'm married to a physician, so, <laughs> you know, anything that I say, so I, I live with a physician, you know, 26 years, three kids, so I, I think I know how he <laughs> thinks. But, you know, he pushes back to me and says, you know, Marsha, um, we're, we're very busy in our offices. We've got these incentives where, you know, physicians are being incented on getting their patients to, to, to get their preventative and their chronic screenings. Um, and, you know, so, so I ask him, I say, Tom, you know, what, what do you think about this? And he, you know, he comes up with great ideas to say, you know, First of all, working with behavioral economists is great, but make sure you have physicians in the loop there um, so you can get direct feedback from them. But I think, you know, from my experience and, and from what I know, um, very, in my opinion, physicians are very analytical. Um, they are, and there are physicians in the audience, I know, um, they are a competitive a group of professionals, so they like to know how they fare against their peers. Um, 
and you know, I think it takes a special person to be a doc. So um, we're learning how they think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's let's open the floor up to some questions. See a couple hands here in the in the front. Thank you. That was really interesting to hear how much Humana is already doing. I'm really curious to know if the behavioral economists have suggested paying the patients, the woman who doesn't want the colonoscopy. What's it worth to the management of her care? 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks? Well, I, and, and so I will tell you, um, you know, there is a, um, we're working with patient incentives right now, and, and we are doing it on the commercial side. So, you know, uh, um, and they, the incentive amounts vary. So, um, you know, and I, I'd have to, I don't know the exact amounts of what it's worth, but suffice it to say that at least on the commercial side, there is a tipping point for what uh, will encourage patient movement to get something done. And as a matter of fact, we as employees of Humana, we, we get encouraged. We are encouraged to get our preventative screenings done and our, you know, our, our chronic care management done. So um, it's, it's happening on the commercial side. And um, you know, with, with the public side, with the Medicare side, there are some constrictions with how much you can incent. And we're working on that. How much and cash is being offered or, or other benefits to the humanity employees? Um, so it comes in the form of points. And with these points, um, for example, you know, it's, it's around your, um, you know, understanding how to reduce your blood pressure or understanding, um, you know, uh, uh, your diabetes and how to, how to deal with uh, bringing your A1C down. Um, but it's, it's more around points and, um, you know, uh, how it all is get it, how it all is tied into premium. Um, but with these points, what you can do is you can get, um, you know, Fitbits. If you've ever seen those Fitbits, where you're, you know, you can uh, do your steps and manage your sleep cycles. Um, so it's redemption of things, if that helps. Mm -hmm. Items. Um, yes. Um, in, in speaking about the, all these drivers, the behavioral economics and, and all that component of it, you know, the foundation of economics is the exchange of value and and uh, human behavior based on exchange of value. Um, it, it, a lot of the elements that are driving the this the shift to from val, from uh, the volume to value, um, are, you have obstacles that are ingrained in this. Um, yesterday, they mentioned about the structure of the medical visit with soap notes and some of these things. Um, you look at two characteristics around that that really dictates the economics to the patient and the economics to the physician. One, the soap notes. Uh, rack auditors will tell you that the chief, if the E and M codes don't support the chief complaint. That's the number one way that you can knock out a reimbursement. So physicians are always very conscious of how, or really they're now the practice administrators are driving them to marry that, uh, those E&M codes and EMRs and things like that, the reg regimentation of it, allow that to be more efficient um, to, to have those codes match. But that's one of the issues on the, the reimbursement for the physician. Another issue is New, New England Journal of Medicine had an article last year speaking about that the issue of bringing up cost to the patient. So a lot of patient adherence is based on they can't afford it. They can't afford the copay. They can't afford those circumstances. So, you know, there's physicians going, well, they don't do it. Well, but they're prevented by codes of ethics and these other things and the education to the physician to even engage that conversation to the patient. So if you introduce those two cost factors into the medical visit, perhaps the physicians would be much more compliant in having these conversations with feedback loops and the patients would be much more adherent on going getting the follow-up procedures if all the economic drivers were tr transparent to everyone. Um, what are your thoughts around that in, in these structural changes that have to, to make, take place, um, even at a very fundamental level? So I, I recall the article in, in New England, in the New England Journal last year about, you know, talking about cost. And, and I agree with you that, um, you know, there's, there's the introducing the factor of cost into the equation. Um, may tip the adherence side, patient adherence. Um, and I also understand the code of ethics discussion um, that, that surrounded and, and was in that article. Um, but I think um, what 
has been done, what's being done now is around transparency. And that kind of takes the physician discussion of cost out of the equation to a certain extent so that the patient can understand, um, you know, CMS is doing this right now, P patients can understand what their cost factors are going to be uh, when they go see a particular provider. Um, and I know many health plans are putting that information out, saying if you go to facility X, this is going to be your copay for a colonoscopy. If you go to facility Y, you're, this is going to be your, your, your copay. Um, I, I think that some of the discussion in that article um, can be you know, circumvented through some of the transparency. Now, in a perfect world, you'd marry that transparency discussion with the quality discussion. So how many did, how many perforated colons uh, happened in per, you know, facility X for that copay? So I think that's gonna also bring about a sea change. I don't know if that answered your question, but those are my thoughts. Ms. James, uh, my name is Pat Kittler. Um, how has Humana, you're soon going to be insuring a lot of more healthy people than you have ever <coughs> insured. And I'm wondering if Humana has given any thought to incenting those healthy people to stay healthy. So, um, you know, actually, I know that the exchanges are coming. That's coming up. Um, to, to be entirely honest with you, I'm not involved with all of those transparent, I'm just all of the exchange discussions. Um, I know that, for example, um, we are doing that, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, for our uh, employer, you know, employer groups. Um, but I don't know that the plans for uh, I don't know what the plans are for incenting that population. Until we know what that population is, I don't know that I can answer your question at this point. So I apologize. May I ask you? Sure. Along the same line, uh, yesterday we were told by United Healthcare that they have insurance power. That, that yesterday we were told by United Healthcare that they have insurance policies that reward insurance for participating in wellness programs. Does Humana have anything like that? Yes. So, um, so we, uh, again, on the employer side, participating in wellness programs, absolutely. For our, Medicaid, for our Medicare population, absolutely. Those, um, those patients who are on the Medicare Advantage side, for example, <gasps> yeah, the silver sneakers, and, and it, you know, so um, I think opportunities like that, because we often talk about chronic disease, we've got to talk more about wellness, too, and prevention before you get to that you know, situation. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Steve Davis. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those physicians that you're trying to figure out um, how, how we think. <laughs> um, so a comment and a question. Uh, I guess my comment is that um, in Jerome Groupman's book about, um, called how, how Doctors Think. That's a great book. There's in my one, opinion, it was an interesting book. And there's one footnote in the entire book. And that yeah. footnote says, this is about how, how other uh, physicians think. I don't know how psychiatrists think. That's that one footnote in the book. Uh, so I'm a psychiatrist. Um, and uh, <laughs> two other psychiatrists and I, um, all from different specialty uh, types of psychiatry. I'm hospital based. Another one is um, um, Ann Hansen's a, uh, a forensic psychiatrist. Uh, and then Dinah Miller is a, 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 a psychotherapist, um, a psychiatrist. So we wrote from different perspectives a book that was published actually two years ago by Hopkins Press called Shrink Wrap, Three Psychiatrists Explain Their Work, um, it, which was kind of a jumping off from a, a blog that we write Shrink Wrap, which we've done for about seven years. So um, one of the most common things we hear in comments on our blog and what we see in, in um, uh, messages in iTunes about the book was thanking uh, us for making the process of getting mental health care um, much more transparent uh, because it's a very kind of opaque um, uh, thing that happens because it's just you and a, and a therapist or a psychiatrist in an office and people don't really know how this works in emergency rooms, um, how do you get hospitalized and things like that. So one of the, compl the biggest complaint is that um, 
patients have a hard time accessing uh, mental health care that, they're insur that they pay for in their insurance and that their employers pay for that they pay for. And one of the biggest problems with accessing um, mental health care seems to be that the provider networks aren't very rich. Um, there may be a hundred people listed, but only um, a small portion of them are they able to actually contact and, and get an appointment in a timely manner. So I guess I'm wondering, my question is, um, how is Humana engaging with um, those providers in their network to be more available and responsive to patients and engaging with patients and uh, helping make sure that there's communication so that they don't just complain on our blog about how they can't get health care, but they can talk to their health insurance company. Thank you. That's, I, I'm, I'm smiling because number, I want to catch up with you after this because, number one, I want to get a copy of that book. But, but number two, um, I'm, I'm really thrilled that, that you brought up that question of accessing mental health um, because I've been thinking about that um, recently um, in terms of how we can better incorporate mental health into our incentive programming. Um, and I'll get to the access thing in just, in just a moment. But um, as a matter of fact, I'm developing a pilot program, that's why I want to talk to you, uh, around mental health. And how do we incent mental health providers? Because we can't, we can't do the same thing that we're doing for primary care. It's, it's not going to work. Um, so, um, so in actuality, this pilot has to do with access. And it's, and interestingly enough, um, we're hearing from patients they can't get into their mental health providers. So, um, I think this is an this is an interesting. Um, perspective that is being developed as we speak, um, but uh, I, I think we could probably all do, the whole system could do a better job about helping patients access, but I'd love to catch up with you after this, if possible. And uh, just one real quick note, we only have a few minutes left, and I want to be, I know I've seen several hands in the back, we just sort of keep our uh, questions and uh, a bit limited, we only have several minutes left. Hi, my name is Steve Dion, I'm with GE Healthcare. I am asking this question more as a patient than as a uh, large, uh, large organization. So healthcare <clears throat> insurance companies in particular seem to be catching up to other, other insurance industry related uh, per, uh, payers. So I'm curious what you think uh, in terms of where innovation is going to head with plans in the future. Are we going to see innovations like vanishing deductibles or accident forgiveness or other similar types of innovations to really get patients engaged in their, in their uh, health and wellness activity? And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, um, that's an absolutely great question. I'm not sure I can answer that at this point. Um, I, I will tell you that um, the innovation that's happening now um, is around first understanding better how patients think and what they, what are their um, touch points for actually being engaged with their disease state um, or their, you know, getting their wellness things done. And then also on the other side, again, as I've talked about, um, getting, you know, understanding how physicians think. Um, in terms of, of the, the other portion of yours, those types of innovation, I, you know, I'm, I'm scratching my head. I, I don't know if we're going to be seeing those. Um, I, I think the answer remains to be seen at this point. So I, I'm, I can't, I, I'm pulling up, you know, blame on this one. I, I can't answer you. Sorry. So got one question back. The uh, recent uh, health affairs on patient engagement had a very long discussion of decision aids that mm -hmm. would facilitate bringing the patient's values into the mm -hmm. decision making process. Has Humana explored that? And I'll give you an example. Uh, colonoscopies that 
we seem to be more concerned about making certain that patients have it. Both of my parents ended up in the emergency department overnight because they have low sodium, and when you have a colonoscopy, it drives your sodium down. And so at 80, in their 80s, I would question whether people with low sodium should have colonoscopies. Mm -hmm. They certainly stopped at this point. It would have been a useful thing to have a decision aid that might have brought out some of those things and allowed an elderly person to say, I'm not so worried about colon cancer. I'm more worried about the low sodium. So, so great question, and the answer is yes. So we're you know, piloting right now with, um, clinical with a decision aid to help patients understand, um, for example, uh, you know, if they need uh, uh, a knee replacement or if they need uh, a procedure done, that's a place to start. Um, and you know, I know that there are several great decisions, decision aids out there, Wellvi, Emmy, that, that help patients understand um, what their, um, you know, and, and be, have a voice in, in what they need to have done in terms of preventative. That's a very good point um, about the low sodium and colonoscopy. So, but the answer is yes. Well, it looks like we've uh, hit our time limit. Already? Yeah, it oh went by God. quickly, didn't it? Oh, that's fast. Well, I wanted to thank Marsha for her time, and uh, this has been uh, very insightful, I think, to everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.